coming, people. Um, okay, let's just think for one hour. We're going to be here together to think and analyze and contemplate and like that. So, yeah, yeah. Let me get the gallery so I can see you all. There you go. So, um, so here we, you know, we're talking about the Buddha's view of the mind. Like I, be, like I say so often, when we hear the words, you hear love, attachment, compassion, generosity, anger, jealousy. We know these words. We're so completely familiar with them. But I think what's interesting is when we hear the Buddhist psychological view talking about those things, we don't hear Buddha say schizophrenia. We don't hear Buddha say, you know, bipolar, personality disorder, ADID, whatever they call it. We think so. Sort of, we think it's kind of cute. Buddha's kind of cute, you know. Oh yeah, love attachment. I mean, you do not go to your therapist and say, "Oh, I was guilty today." You, you know, you we've got these heavy duty labels. So, without insulting modern psychology, you know, the the Buddha. I mean, he's such a genius, but it's hard for us to see this. He has, in, in his own direct, from his own direct experience, he has unpacked and unravelled his own mind based upon this incredible brilliant skill that these indians before him with whom he studied invented created so that they could access the subtler levels of our mind we don't even posit these so we have these cute he has these cute words still it's three thousand years they've been using these words they haven't changed their words you know so then what we tend to do is we go, oh, there's real psychology over there. I've got a personality disorder i've got adhd i've got ocd i've got all these names we have right and we see them as very concrete, but we somehow see them as more serious. I've oh, got attachment. Oh, it's so cute. You know, a bit of love, a bit of attachment. But we hear that OCD is so absolute, ADHD, these absolute diseases that we have found, we think, you know. Well, I'm not trying to be rude to people, but there's nothing in the mind that the Buddhist view hasn't identified. And the key thing for the Buddha, so all of these words, you can simply translate them. If you had a little kind of dictionary, a little kind of, you'd have ADHD, what's that? You know, what's attention deficit? What is it? ADHD, what's attention deficit? What's that eight next Disorder. Letter? But what, a a attention, de attention deficit oh, there are four disorder. Letters, some with four letters, ADHD or AD, what is that one? Adult. Hyperactivity. Oh, hyperactivity. Is it really? Hyperactivity. Okay. But whatever, but all they, OCD, what's that? That one. These ones, they're all uh, bipolar, you know, up and down like a yo-yo. used to call it manic depression. They're all talking about the mind and they're all talking about the uncontrolled mind, uncontrolled thoughts, you know. So some people have really bizarre fantasy thoughts. Some people have kind of simple fantasy thoughts about chocolate cake. Some people think about killing people. Some people think about torturing people. Some people have fantasy, all kinds of fantasies. So the character, so the, the, the character of the types of minds, they're simply attachment. They're mainly fundamentally attachment, over-exaggerating certain things. So as to, the, as to what it is, the actual content, that depends on the karma you've got. So that, that's the Buddha's view. You know, you come into this life with certain tendencies, you know. So my friend on death row in Kentucky, he thinks all the time about torturing people. So we call him insane and he's on death row. He probably tried to kill people. He probably did kill people. Then we, we And we have no idea why that's there. And then we have other people having constant fantasies about being this and being that and hearing voices and people telling them to do this and do that. So, but in, in, I mean, there's, there's more to it than that, but in the end, it can all be explained in Buddhist psychology. I mean, but there's a shock to us. We think, oh, that's just fundamentalist, Rabina. Come on, surely we've learned a few new things since Buddha. I mean, we think we've invented things in the, in the modern world that no one else knew before. Yeah, in terms of maybe you want to find new atoms and things, new labels for them. But I mean, you know, that even in the, is the Buddhist view. But the, the thing is, using the Buddhist view, the thing that's unique about it, that's so helpful if we can take it on board, is that, you know, as I talk repeatedly, is that the Buddhist view divides all the thousands and thousands and thousands of thoughts in there in this great big soup as far as we're concerned it's a great big mixed up soup not even just peas and carrots and potatoes all bumping into each other in a big soup but they're pureed soup i mean they're so totally integrated then you know the angry thoughts and the jealous thoughts and the attached thoughts and the crazy thoughts and the this one and that one they're all mixed together so completely we just can't tell the difference and anyway because also there are a thousand thoughts a second I and mean, i think modern psychology says that buddha would totally agree 
So it seems impossible we can handle this mind, but that is the job that Buddha says we can do, and they are the methods he has done and he's given us. So the methods are there. I mean, this is like pretty miraculous if you think about it. That was not, there's no equivalent in modern psychology with respect to us. There's no equivalent. And anything we are learning, we're learning it from the Buddha, you know, all these, I mean, you talk about, all well, talk about mindfulness, it's coming straight from the Buddha. So nothing's new, you know. And it's marvelous that finally now we're listening to some things he's saying. So in general, the point is, he's, there is a method for identifying the thoughts in your mind. Of course, it's a hugely sophisticated job. If there are a thousand thoughts a second, it is clearly a super sophisticated job. And you really can't begin to do that until you've got some concentration, which you get from doing shamatha, this technique. But that doesn't mean we can't do something without concentration. Yes, we can. We can still do masses of work. We can start where we are, you know. So yes, there are, so then he divides all these contents. He divides the contents, as we discuss so often, into three categories. There's no fourth category. Don't just, he, this is really quite profound. And if we can begin to understand this one already, we have a starting point. There are those that are neurotic, delusional. These words are very real. He would have liked the word neurotic. Delusional this is a really powerful word. Just very, very disturbing. Non-virtuous. Many of them, but especially when it's, I mean, they're non-virtuous in the sense, and that's a really key term in Buddhist psychology, which we just dismiss it in the West. We, we don't like to talk like that in modern psychology because it sounds like you're judging somebody. But this is fundamentally necessary to understand if you want to understand Buddha's take on the mind. So you've got those states of mind that are neurotic, delusional, disturbing, non-virtuous, negative. Then you have the second category, positive, optimistic, valid, re reasonable states of mind, not delusional and virtuous. These are the two key ones. The third lot, I like to call them the mechanics. These are states of mind that without which you wouldn't function. Whether you're a murderer or a meditator, you could not do your job if you didn't have good memory, if you didn't have concentration, if you didn't have discrimination, if you didn't have attention. And there are many of these that are the fundamentals of our mind that enable us to function, whether you're a saint or a sinner. So the reason you want to develop those, which you develop in single point of concentration, is so that you can utilize, you can develop the skill to, to distinguish between the neurotic voices and the positive ones. This is something that's fundamental to Buddhist psychology. It's not how we talk in the West. It's not how we talk in modern psychology. Because it sounds like you think, oh, I'm a bad person. I've got negative thoughts. We want to kill ourselves, you know. But we need to understand this. We, that, that means we have to understand what it means. What does it mean, non-virtuous? What does it mean, negative, you know? This is based on the entire view of the Buddha's, the Buddha's understanding of how a person, what a person is. So he's, these, these unhappy states of mind, these negative states of mind, these deluded states of mind, they are the ones that cause us suffering, he said. So, I mean, the reason to look at them is, is to stop yourself from suffering. But whereas we use this as a weapon to beat ourselves up with, oh, you mean I'm a bad person, I've got jealousy, I've got anger, I'm a bad person. We love to beat ourselves up. You know, we go absolutely mad with that. But that's not what the Buddha's trying to get us to see. He's trying to get us to see why we're suffering. He's trying to get us to see why we're suffering. One way of framing, one way of describing the entire Buddha's path, you know, is in terms of its being methods to stop suffering and therefore methods to get happy. I mean, that sounds nice, you know. So the things that cause us, so then we have to look at what causes us suffering. If we want happiness and suffering, you've got to see what the causes are. And this is the Four Noble Truths. So for Buddha, it's very clear there are two main causes of happiness and two main causes of suffering. This almost seems too simple. We can't believe that. I mean, when we have these conferences, you know, I mean, like, for example, Tony Steele, the, the, the man who runs our center in Sydney, Vajrayana Institute, for 10, 12 years now, 12 years, 13 years, 14 years, he's been running conferences, two of them, mind and its potential and happiness and its causes. And it's totally so excitingly popular. I mean, there are hundreds of variations of definitions of happiness, hundreds of variations of methods of how to get it. So even this is the most fundamental one to understand. So let's look at that one before we even look at the how to identify the neurotic states of mind, which are the causes of suffering, and how to identify the positive states of mind, which are the causes of happiness. We're going to get beneath it. Well, what is suffering? What is happiness? Buddha's got these definitions. He's sorted this stuff out 3,000, 2,500 years ago. You don't have to like his methods, but he's done his job. 
the entire path, which is studied in the great monastic university system since, you know, way back before the Buddha. And then the Nalanda tradition, as His Holiness always says, we are the Nalanda tradition. This amazing monastic university system that thrived for many centuries in India, in northern India, Nalanda. All, the, all the, the big names you hear when you want to, when you study any Buddhist philosophy, the big names, they're all coming from Nalanda. So what happened is Buddhism started to, to disintegrate in India, whatever reasons, you know, you should do groups of people coming in and fighting each other. And so it gradually disintegrated, and then it, but it moved straight intact all the way straight to Tibet, 7th century, 8th century, all these great scholars went straight to Tibet. And so it's, it's been a living tradition picked up from India and into Tibet. As His Holiness says, we are the Nalanda tradition, you know. So that's extant right now out of in, out of Tibet. I mean, they're struggling, but they're still, you know, the system is now existing in India and the big monastic universities there. So they study all these things like 10, 15, 20 years. And many, many, many people of our culture are doing this now, all the nuts and bolts of this view, this world view of the Buddhas. But let's look at the Four Noble Truths. It's really simple. The concepts are simple, you know. He says, the first one is there is suffering. The second is there are causes. The third is, there are way there, there is this there is the state there is the there there does exist the cessation that's how they talk about it a bit abstract way of putting it there does exist the cessation of suffering and its causes and then the method at the fourth one how to do it so then now let's look at what is happiness what is suffering so crystal clear for the buddha crystal clear I do this little blog every couple of weeks or week or so. It's supposed to be a week, but I get a bit lazy. And then the recent one I've done is what is happening. It almost sounds a bit too technical the way I talked about it. I plan to say some more. Let's talk, discuss it here. What is happiness? What is suffering? Well, the first point for the Buddha, this is the biggest shock for us. Their names, their names for states of mind. There's their names for states of mind. So in this is and this is what's even more fascinating. You've got your you've got your three categories of states of mind. There's no fourth. You've got your neurotic, deluded, negative, ridiculous, disturbing, eye-based, fear-based ones that make us insane and make us crazy and make us harm other people because of past karma, habits, my poor friend, my torturer friend on death row, come into this life with these tendencies. He doesn't know why. His mother didn't teach him to torture. We come into this life with tendencies from habit driven by certain states of mind. So we've got the negative, neurotic, deluded states of mind. Then you've got the positive reason ones, love, compassion, empathy. So the crucial thing that distinguishes these two, just to say it here for now, the, the thing that distinguishes the first lot from the second lot is that the first lot are rooted in the fundamental, the, the, it, it, they're rooted in, in the mistaken view, which is the first of these delusions of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a separate bereft sense of a concrete self. So abstract for us. And all the others are branch voices of that one. They're all, but the thing that characterizes them, and this is the thing we have to understand, is that, they're, that they are misconceptions. All these emotions, we talk about the emotions, but that's just the, ex, that's just the habitual experience that the body also experiences that's from the habit of having these thoughts in our minds from countless lifetimes. They're finally misconceptions and the bones of our being. That's why we've got to have concentration to get down to the level where we unpack and unravel these misconceptions to prove that they have no basis in reality. This is what it means. This is the first lot. Second lot have a basis in reality. They're, they're based in interdependence. They're not totally, they're not totally accurate yet. Love, compassion, wisdom, kindness, generosity, forgiveness. They are valid, not because God says or Buddha says, it's because they're rooted in reality and what's reality interdependence and the third lot of the mechanics so if happiness and suffering are states of mind which category you've got to ask where do they fit because everything in buddhism that's a state of mind fits into one of these three there's no other category please hear this so of the thousands of states of mind that you have in your head they're all going to fit into these three categories already that you should come it's already should calm us down Oh, only three categories. I'm going to try to be this, this, or this. Which one is it? This, this, or this. What's attachment? That's under the first one. That's a neurotic one. Oh, there's love. Oh, that's under the second. Oh, there's attention. Oh, that's under the third. There's no fourth category. Hear it. Already it should be helping our mind. Phew, at least three categories. I can sort them all out. And your job as a Buddhist is to put them in the right categories. 
Oh, there's love. That's the first, second category. Oh, there's attachment. That's the first one. That's rubbish. Get rid of it. The second one, that's good. Grow it. Third one, I need that. Attention, intention, discrimination, concentration. Better grow that one so they can use, you can use those to help you do the job of distinguishing between the negative ones and the positive ones. It's not a complicated concept. It's like you've got three types of things living, growing in your garden. You know? Herbs. There's the good ones that you want to grow, the ones, the rubbish ones you've got to get out. Then there's the skills you need. It's a bit just a different analogy here. That's it. That's it. So the job is to distinguish between the negative and the positive. That's it. That's it. That's it. All the way from here to Buddhahood. So happiness, a state of mind. That's interesting. Which category does it fit into? Is it a negative one or a positive one, please, Buddha? Well, it's neither, honeys. It's the third category. And this is very confusing to us, but listen, we've got to understand this. So happy, a happy, there's, there's many of these, the, the mechanics, as I call them. One is attention. One is intention, even not like good motivation, but intention, uh, volition, I will. That's neither negative nor positive. It depends on what the motivation that drives it, that makes it negative or positive. Then you've got concentration, neither negative nor positive, but crucial. See, or mindfulness, for example, which is a holy word in the West, got all these bells and whistles on it. It's literally the capacity to not forget what you're doing moment by moment. That's it. That's what it, mindfulness means. So is that negative or positive, Buddha? It's neither. It's a mechanic. It's, it's one of the mechanical bits. It's neither good nor bad in the sense of virtuous and non-virtuous, in the sense of negative and positive. So we've got to get used to those labels and see what Buddha means by them. The third lot are neither negative nor positive, neither virtuous nor non-virtuous, but they're crucial. You've got to have intention. I will. And then after intention, it homes in and you have attention. You pay attention. Well, a murderer pays attention and a meditator pays attention. It's a crucial. The point that makes it useful is whether the motivation is what drives it. So now, Another cat, another state of mind in the third category is called discrimination. It's, it's working every millisecond and it's the ability to distinguish between this and that. Every millisecond, square, round, this color, that color, carrot, potato, every millisecond discrimination is working, 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 working. If you lose that, you've lost the plot. You're insane. Mindfulness is when you start to get, you know, Alzheimer's and all those diseases. You've lost the ability to have short-term memory. That's what it is, but virtually. They're not negative and they're not positive, but they're crucial and depends on what you do is how you use them, therefore makes it a negative or positive action that you do, you know. So we're now getting to the one of happiness and suffering if they're in the third category, which is so weird for us. What does it mean? What does it mean? Well, there's a, there's a word called feeling. It's the name of one of the many states of mind in the third category, feeling. And there's only three kinds. There are only th there are those that are uh, pleasant feelings. There are those that are unpleasant feelings, and there are those that are neither or neutral. Well, let's forget the neutral, okay? We only care about the pleasant and the unpleasant, and so they they are they are terms. Another term for a, a pleasant feeling is a happy feeling, or the noun happiness. Uh, a term for unpleasant feeling is another word called suffering feeling or the noun suffering. They are names of states of mind. They are neither virtuous nor non-virtuous. Now it happens to be we all want the happy feelings and we do not want the unhappy feelings. So this is the first point. Now Buddha says, Okay, honeys, I've found a method. That's what he's telling us. That's all he is telling us. I have found a method to stop unpleasant feelings, to stop suffering feelings. And I, therefore, I have found a method to have happy feelings. That's it. That's what he's telling us. So the problem for us is... We, for example, you know, we, 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 if I can relationship, let's say I've got, you know, Gonzalo, my boyfriend, and I have a relationship with Gonzalo. What happens is this. I have one state of mind for him that's in the first lot. It's called attachment. So that's a deluded, neurotic, 
distorted, delusional state of mind that's rooted in being a concept deep in my bones, but from countless lifetimes of experiencing it, it's totally just, you know, automatic. What it's saying, what it does is this thought, this concept is a concept. It over, it, it's come, it's, its energy is emotional hunger feeling I haven't got enough and I'm not enough. That's its energy. So then because I haven't got enough and I feel I haven't got enough, I'm always looking for something. So this attachment's job is to find an object because this schizophrenic view, and this is a good term, believes this dissatisfaction in me is so distressing, I've got to find something to fill up the gaping hole. So what attachment's job is, is to find something out there, a cake a handbag, a boy, I mean, attachment is limitless in its capacity to find, to identify based on your past karma, the object that you believe that when you get it will fill you with happy feelings, the third category. This is all completely inarticulate. Of course, we don't analyze, we don't speak like this, but this is the analysis that Buddha is putting on these, this process. So already we confuse so many conf so much confusion here because of the habit of attachment, this junky in us that's totally primordial, totally automatic, drives the universe as far as Buddha is concerned. It's effectively the main cause of all suffering, and this is like a joke to us if we look at modern psychology. We can't even begin to understand what Buddha is talking about until we analyze it. This drives immense this attachment, and it's at the level of assumption. The assumption is I am not enough, I don't have enough, and therefore because we're so addicted to the outside world and we are in a body of the five senses and the, and the, and the body of the five senses has objects of the senses and they're necessarily out there, so they're looking like a vampire, attached, looking like a vampire for a boy, let's say, or in my friend's case on death row, looking for a person to torture because of his habit or a fish to kill, that's your habit, or a jewel to buy, which is your habit, depends on what attachment is habitually addicted to. So attachment is in the first category. It's neurotic, delusional, and has no basis in reality. It's a fantasy that we have made up. So then its job is when it gets Gonzalo, gets that shape, it then exaggerates. The more hungry I am, the more grotesquely attachment exaggerates his deliciousness, his role in what? Giving me happy feelings. I mean, attachment is just a means to an end. Attachment is not the main thing. It is the main cause of suffering. It's a lie, but it's, it's a means to an end because we believe it believes totally. We are believing totally that when I get Gonzalo, I'll get happy feelings. Happy feelings are in the third category, neither good nor bad. So now, it, that's what happens. So then what's Buddha's problem? Why is he arguing? We know that when I do get Gonzalo and I have contact with whatever sense is most pre prevalent, I will. it will definitely trigger happy feelings. Fact. So where's Buddha's problem? What's his argument? He's not saying it won't trigger happy feelings. In fact, we all know about the best type of happy feelings we can get on this planet is contact with another body. Unless you're so dissatisfied, you'd rather kill people. Depends on your habit. We know this. So his Buddha's not arguing that we don't get happy feelings. We do. But he's saying the character of those happy feelings, because they're so polluted by like a junkie, you know, so the happiness of a junkie. With respect to junkies, with respect to anybody who's a junkie, whether you want 25 girls a day or 25 glasses of wine a day, or you want a five hours of video, porn video a day, whatever it might be that you get, it's true, it does trigger some, but the more hungry, the more neurotic the attachment, the more polluted the happy feeling. It's like in the end, if you look at a person who's a junkie, completely full on junkie, and they get their quick fix, that's what that's called happiness. That's the end result of the, of the whole point of putting the needle in your skin. But look at how, look at the quality of the happiness. It's grotesque, it's desperate, it's frantic, and it's completely polluted. It's like a joke to call it happiness. Well, that's the happiness we all get now. It is still a happy feeling. It's called a happy feeling. It's in the third category. So already the problem is we completely conflate attachment and, and the happy feeling. We think they're the same thing. We think they're the same thing. As long as that's why when we first hear Buddhism, we hear, we hear the Buddha tells us we've got to give up attachment. We go, as Lama Zobra says, we go, oh, I've got to give up my heart. I've got to give up my happiness because we assume attachment and happiness are the same. The other mistake we make 
The other mistake we make, we're so addicted to believing that the outside object is the thing that will give me, that is the cause of happiness. And we wrote down our four noble truths. One, there is happiness. Two, the cause is getting consano. That's it. So we conflate not only the happiness feeling, which is third category, with attachment, which is the first category. We also conflate the object, which has got, which is neither an object. Gonzalo is a, is a bunch of atoms, is a bunch of skin and pee pee and caca in his body, if he's like the rest of us, with hair and eyes and noses and, you know, and bones and a mind in there. It's not a dead body. It's not a dead Gonzalo. You'd be changing your mind if it were. So then we make, attached makes this fantasy. And then believes when I get him. I'll get the happy feelings. So one, we so uh, addicted to this view that we even when we talk, and this is the big point now, when we talk about happiness, tell me about, oh, you, you, Rabina's happy. Look at her. She's happy. She's smiling. Tell me about your happiness, Rabina. What will I do? What will I describe? I will describe the object. I'll describe Gonzalo. But he's neither happy. So we so conflate happiness and the object, attachment and the object, and then we conflate attachment and happiness, and then we now conflate happiness with the object. So we've got completely up a garden without a, no, you can't be up a garden without a paddle, up a creek without a paddle. We lost the plot. We've completely got so many misconceptions. We've got to unpack. This is the type of analysis that we need to do if we think we're Buddhist. And you can't start, you can't do it first experientially because all this stuff is so mixed together, like I said, with a big soup. You've got to first do the intellectual. You can't walk into a forest with zero knowledge about botany and start, ent interpret start identifying all the different planting. Then we really got to learn theory first because this stuff is so primordial. So one, we think the happiness is the external object. Two, we think happiness is the same as attachment. Then we think Buddha says we've got to give it up, we get all depressed. So we chuck the baby out of the bathwater. So what about love? Where does love fit into this? That's in the third, that's in the second category. It's a virtue. What's love? Love is may Gonzalo be happy. Love is reasonable. Love is virtuous. Love is good. Love is altruistic. Love is connected to reality. Love is rooted in interdependence. It sees Gonzalo and wants him to be happy. That's a virtue. So we also conflate love and attachment. So all this complete mixture we've got of these different states of mind. No wonder we're confused. No wonder we don't know where to turn, you know. So this is a fundamental, it seems so intellectual initially, but like anything, of course it's intellectual. Botany is intellectual. Bach's theory of music is intellectual. And, you, and then you look at beautiful flowers and you can see these boring intellectual words. You think, how can you relate those beautiful flowers to that boring intellect? But you can. How can you hear that beautiful music and then you see all these weird notes on a piece of paper? You've got to learn the theory first, babies. You can't escape it. Are we communicating? So this is theory first. Then the point is, when you listen to Buddha and he tells us, you know, honey, children, you know, honey, child, you know, petals, I have found from my own experience is a job I've done. Here's my methodology that the, the first lot, the negative ones, the neurotic ones, the deluded ones, the painful ones, the crazy ones that make us completely go insane and cause our own pain. Forget about the harm they cause us to do to others. That comes in a minute. They are not at the core of our being and can be removed. We should be paying $10 million to hear this information. It's so miraculous. It's can't, we can't believe it. It's a revelation. And, it, and that's why if you've got a garden full of weeds and flowers and herbs and you just assume the weeds run the show, and the, you know, especially if you live in the tropics and, the, and the, flat, you know, the big trees are coming, climbing up your house and under the floor and in the roof, and you have no idea about botany, of course you're going to get a bit depressed and frantic because you don't know that you can pull the bloody weeds out. And then you meet a botanist. Oh, Rabina, I've got a method. You can pull the weeds out. Suddenly, even though the weeds are still running in your house, you know that there's a method to get rid of them. It should give us, it should ground us in sanity and confidence. So the thing is, we all know we go crazy with our uncontrolled minds. So some of us, yes, have uncontrolled minds, more uncontrolled than others. That's a fact. It's not, it, you, you can't argue with that. And definitely, and the uncontrolled is one thing. Deluded is another. Uncontrolled, usually they're out of the deluded because no, I've never heard a person worry about having too many good thoughts. Oh, I can't stop all my good thoughts, Rubina. Don't worry about it, baby. Keep going. You're not going to ever get upset about that. 
It's the negative thoughts that make us crazy because they're rooted in the sense of an I. And this is the, this is the one that's the main one. So attachment effectively is the main cause of suffering in day-to-day -day life. But it's rooted in the root delusion, the root neurosis, which is so primordial, it's it's almost impossible to, you know, initially to identify it. We don't even have a word equivalent for it in modern psychology. You know, colloquially, it's known as ego grasping, this primordial assumption of an inconcrete, in, a concrete, solid, identifiable, real, pointable, separate, set in stone me. Attachment is its main voice. So th the tragedy is with us, why we all go crazy, is because we, we hear, we feel the pain of the negative thoughts. We feel the, it's like the residual result. It's like the, it's like, it's like the thoughts are there deep in the bones and they're habitual. But because this is the other point, the other point is it's the other thing that we make a mistake. Because we're so addicted to our bodies, we're so addicted to our bodies. We identify with our body. This is the materialist view. As Lama Yeshe says, we make the body the boss. We are so identified with our bodies. We don't know what's going on in our mind until our body feels it. And that's like, as a analogy I use, that's like not realizing that you, you know, that not realizing until you're going 150 kilometer miles an hour on the freeway you'd haven't noticed that your wheels are falling off you got to wait till you're at 150 miles an hour and then you notice that's how too late we leave looking into our mind we wait till the body feels something so then of course we conflate the body experiences with the mental experiences but they're completely separate so because we can't stand the pain of anger, attachment, out of control, attachment, fantasies, jealousy, all the rest, we can't stand the pain of them. So, of course, when we notice them finally, when, the, when, the, when you know, Vesuvius has erupted and we notice the pain, when the body tells us, <clears throat> then we nearly go crazy. We can't cope. We can't stand it. We will do anything to make these crazy feelings go away, isn't it? And this is where the courage comes in. Yeah, use whatever method you can. Take your Prozac. I don't care. Take your drugs. Go to your therapist. Do every method you can to help you kind of hold all this craziness. But when we can start to think about the Buddhist approach and start to listen to the teachings and start to study them, and then we, we can see the craziness, but when we start to realize it's okay, Rabina, these are not at the core of my being, they can be removed. Not immediately, of course not, but that, that alone should give us confidence. So that means we have to then do the key job while we've still got these crazy thoughts, while you look in your garden, you thought that all those weeds and all those crazy plants in there were, were real, were intrinsic, were at the core of the garden and were just the way gardens are. And then you meet a botanist who tells you no, that you can get rid of them. They're still there the next day. Just because you've discovered they're going to get rid of, they're still there. You've got to do the work. But at least you come more reasonable now. At least you realize, my God, they're not, they're, not in, they're not intrinsic. I can remove these weeds eventually. Then you get more courage. And then that, what that means is you start to become familiar with your mind. You start to hear the thoughts. Yes, there are so many. It's too many to identify every one. We can articulate some of them. So it's like, that's why if we can write them down, it's quite helpful. You can do an analysis and you look at the sentences. Well, is that a valid thought? Is that, is that an exaggerating thought? Gonzalo is so divine, I will die without him. You start to analyze that thought. What does that mean? So it's, you, you put, that's thought, that sentence is an expression of attachment. Then another one, you know, you, 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 know, you might have delusions of grandeur and think you're like a saint or something. Or you think you're like, you know, and you, then you're, 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 I am really a saint. And you want to analyze, am I really a saint yet? No, I haven't got body cheating. I haven't realized emptiness. So I'm not a saint. So that's an invalid sentence. That's an invalid thought. So you've still got it. It's crazy inside you, but you analyze it and you, you, you decide which category it fits into, the first or the second. Is it negative? Is it positive? It's a type of analysis to do. It's kind of hard work because we just wish it would all go away. So the key one is, as long as I says, bad enough that we see 
Gonzalo, let's say example, I see Gonzalo in a way that he doesn't exist because that's what attachment is doing. It's making him divine. It's making him look concretely, permanently the cause of all my happiness. It's complete, absurd, absurd exaggeration of the reality of Gonzalo, you know? So bad enough, I see Gonzalo in a way that he doesn't exist through the lenses of my attachment. That's bad enough. But he said, the thing that's the killer, and this is my word, the thing that keeps us locked in the misery is that I believe that story. So that's the key one we have to do. And this is the one that's really intense. You have the crazy thoughts, you think you're a saint. You have the crazy thoughts, you think Gonzalo is going to make you happy. You have the crazy thoughts, you think you've just found the answer to all happiness. Whatever it might be, a delusional thought, you have the thought that torturing is good. It appears to you this way because you've got the habit. Then you have this part of your wisdom inside you. The wisdom is there. You check, no, that's not a valid thought, Rabina. Even though the, everything in you wants to torture, even though everything in you believes Gonzalo is divine, even though everything in you believes you're a special person. But your wisdom is sort of, Rabina, listen to me. Little wisdom voice pops up. No, 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 Rabina, listen, listen, darling. That's not a valid thought. Phew, I won't believe it. It's still there raging, shouting. You don't believe it. That's the saving. That's the part that keeps us sane. So we have to allow, you can't stop the crazy thoughts to be there. You can't stop the weeds overnight, but you can start to realize they're not at the core of the, of the garden. They can be removed. And then you learn the methods to slowly, slowly weaken the weeds and grow the flowers. This is an enormously difficult job. You've been doing the job for 50 years being a Buddhist. You can still be overrun one day by depression. And when it arises and hits you like a ton of bricks, the thoughts arise and from the junky past. And it feels so true. It feels like life is worthless. It feels like nothing is worthwhile. It feels like you're useless. But your wisdom says, no, Rabina, that's an invalid thought. Don't believe it. This is a major part of practice. Of course, it's not easy, but it's possible. And then when you do your other practices, like you do your Tara practice, or you do your Manjushri, or you do your this and you do your that, they kind of put atomic bombs under the habits. They're like, they're the practices that support your practice. They're like doing, like you got to hit the, you got to, you know, you got to um, pull out the weeds, but you got to learn all the techniques that help you do it better. Get a good spade and a good this and a good shovel and a good something. They're the tools, they're like the, the tools that enable you to do it better. That's all your different other practices, your prostrations, your purification, your, your devotion in the Buddha. They are like the preliminaries. They kind of prime your mind, enabling you to do the actual job of unpacking and unraveling the delusions you know, and moving gradually forward. And then the other thing we have to do every day, which we forget, because all the negative thoughts loom large, because the weeds look like they dominate the garden, you forget to notice the flowers. You forget. Just panic, all these weeds, I can't cope. But there's so much virtue in our minds, we don't even notice. We don't even notice because the negative thoughts are so huge. We don't even notice the good things. You know, we have to notice them, have to delight in them and grow them and nourish them and identify because they are who we really are, not the others. This is Buddhist, this is Buddhist psychology. This is Buddhist psychology. So ask me some questions, darlings, if you'd like to. Yes, please, um, if you want to ask a question, hit the uh, raise hand icon under reactions in the bottom of the screen. Yeah, any questions at all, please. Any old thing. Yes, Greg, talk to me. Hi, Rubina. Hello, Venerable uh, Rubina. Um, what about uh, recurring um, thoughts and, and negative feelings about yeah. past actions that, that just come up every day, specific incidences? Sorry, I'm not trying to be too personal, but what do you mean? I don't know if you give me, give me an example. It's a general example, not your own necessarily your own experience. I don't want to be personal about you. What do you mean? Let's say, that? let's say I've, I've, I've hurt a family member. By oh, some action you've I've done in said. the past. Okay. 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 You mean you, you, you keep it, keep some, you've done something in the past that's harmful to another. Is that what you're saying? It's, it yeah. Keeps, very oh. residual guilt. Okay. Is, is it something you keep doing or has it happened in the past? 
No, it's happened in the past, but the residual. Guilt even, okay, is... good. So this is okay, Greg. I hear you, darling. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Okay, so first of all, the state of mind we're discussing here. There's two parts. I mean, this, this is where two we can have the thoughts completely mixed together. So when I look at Gonzalo, if I've got lots of virtue, I can have a lot of love. I can really want him to be happy, but then I also have the attachment. So in here, there are two things going on as well. There would be guilt, which is in the first category. It's a neurotic, deluded state of mind, and I'll describe it. But it's also mixed with valid one, which is a genuine, a genuine. Um, a genuine, you know, sorrow that you've done something to harm another based on compassion. So first, you've got to recognize they're both there together, like my love and my attachment are mixed together. And I've got to see the difference. So this is a part that's really hard, Greg. So it's marvelous that you can look at an action that you did that did harm another, and you can be sorry that you did it. But the, the trouble is, it gets polluted by the negative neurotic eye based state of mind, which is guilt, which is really just internalized anger. So then that 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 kind of it, and then, and then the, the character of all the negative states of mind is they're very stuck. They're very stuck. So guilt, basically, what it's saying is, it what guilt, what anger does in general is over exaggerate the bad qualities of somebody. You did this, and you did that, and you did this, and you're a bad person. Well, that's what guilt is doing, Greg, inside you. That's the negative aspect. It's saying I did this, and I did that, and then it's concluding I'm a bad person. But it's also quick; you can't notice those thoughts. That's what guilt is saying. So that's destructive, useless. But we can't distinguish it from a valid attitude, which is a genuine conscience and a recognition you harm somebody and out of compassion. That's fantastic, that part. So this is why we have, you know, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's the practice that we call purification. It's a really practical, down-to-earth process that we do at the end of the day. And Amazoba says we're insane not to do it every day. Given that everything we think and do and say leaves seeds in our mind, programs our mind, then doing purification at the end of the day, this, this particular practice, which I'll describe briefly, it'd like put atomic bombs under these tendencies we have. So the first step, in the, it's like the four R's. The first step, um, we leave this every evening at our center, and the center now. We do it at nine o'clock every night. We, someone leaves it for 30 minutes, this practice. So you might like to join it one day. You can look it up, express meditation, 90 minutes, 30 minutes. So the first step is regret. This is what we usually call guilt. So regret is a wholesome attitude. It isn't guilt. It's basically, you see, the, the basis of this practice is the recognition based on Buddha's teachings about karma, that everything we think and do and say programs our mind, leaves seeds in our mind grows our mind there's nothing that goes astray greg so there you so the first step is you acknowledge it's sort of like the analogy and this is they use this analogy like this like you've eaten poison or like you've eaten sugar and you realize you know you've, you've got the tendency to get diabetes so the so the guilty attitude would say oh my god i ate sugar i'm a complete disaster this is no good i'm hopeless i'm a bad person and you just sink into more misery that's guilt are you with me that's guilt. But the positive attitude, if it's regret, is I can't believe I ate sugar. What an idiot. I didn't realize what I've done. I didn't realize that, that was, I didn't realize when I did that what I did. So now what am I going to do about it? How can I fix it? That's a, so regret is a po proactive, positive attitude about the things you've done wrong because you, and this is the first point, Greg. The first step is to be sick of suffering for yourself. You, you're sick of this habit. You don't want to keep doing this kind of thing. You don't want to stay with this misery. It's too horrible. Don't worry about compassion yet. This is the first step, regret. I'm sick. I, I did do this and I did do that and I did do this based upon my own self-centeredness, based by my own delusions, and I don't want this habit to grow in my mind and I don't want the future suffering. So the next step would be, when whom can I turn to? The second of the four R's, and this is called reliance. So for those of us who are Buddhist, the second step is like, whom can I turn to? Where's the doctor? And that's the Buddha. He's not our creator. The Buddha is like a, a person we rely upon who can give us the method to, 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 to heal the problem, to give us the method to, to stop the, the damage that the sugar does, you understand, to stop us from getting diabetes. The doctor, we rely upon the doctor. So we would visualize the Buddha and we'd take refuge, something like that. But the second part in the second step is now you have compassion for those you've harmed. First step is like compassion for yourself. Regrets like compassion for yourself of the dumb things you did in the past that harmed an action you did that harmed others, but which leaves a seed in your mind that makes you suffer that will cause you future suffering because that's the way karma is. 
So the second step is after refuge, you then think, well, and then you have compassion. You have real compassion for those you've harmed. Third step is you do a little practice. We would do a visualization and we do a particular mantra. This is the fourth, the third step called the, the remedy, or they sometimes call it the antidote. So in this case, it could also just be something you do in your own life. You know, you could do a, a, an opposite action. So the antidote in this case might be, I don't know, it could be anything in relation to that person. If the person's still around, if they're alive, you know, an antidote to that could simply be, you know, confessing, I mean, asking that person to forgive you or something like that. It mightn't happen if they're dead, you can't do that. But in general, we do it as a practice, as a meditation, where you, where you say a certain mantra, you, you imagine purifying the, the, the seeds in your mind, the, the tendency in your mind. And the fourth one is called the resolve, it's the determination not to do it again. These are the four steps. There's more, way more to it than this. It's all based upon the philosophy of karma, and there's a way of describing in more depth these steps. But there's no there's, there's no karma, there's no tendency we can't change. So these are the four steps, acknowledging it and regretting it because you're sick of suffering, having compassion for the person you harmed, and we talk about taking refuge. Your third, you do a little practice to purify it, and four is the determination not to do it again. So that's, in general, the attitude, and there's no karma you can't purify. There's nothing in our mind that's set in stone. So the added component, of course, if it's family and they're still alive, you know, then you can always, another whole part of it is to say something to the person. I mean, that's a possibility. It's up to you and the person and the scenario. But even, and this is where sometimes my friends in prison, for example, will be devastated because what can you do if you've killed a person? You can't get them to forgive you. They're dead, you know. But this is the point about in the Buddha's view, there's two parts. There's one, you changing your own mind and purifying your own mind. And then the second is how you can how you can also have compassion and fix it with the other person. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Let's say you let's say you you go to some person, you ask them to forgive you, but let's say they're still so angry with you, they refuse to, then that often leaves us feeling devastated because we, I think in our culture, we rely upon another person making us feel better to feel that we fixed it. But you've got to fix it in your own mind first. And then it's a bonus if somebody else forgives you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are we communicating, Greg? Good. Thank you so much. What else, people? What else, people? Other points? Yes. Uh, that, that last portion was great. You're stuck, Greg. I didn't hear you, darling. Speak up. Say it again, Greg. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. I was. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, I was just commenting that that was very helpful. That I'm very happy. The point. So happy. No, I'm very, thank you. I'm really glad, Greg. Good. Go on. Who, and this is something else I'd say, uh, just an added point about, about forgiveness. I think it's interesting that culturally, forgiveness is something huge in our, in our culture, and it's a really good thing, but let's analyze it for a second. You see, I think when I, was a, like when I was a Catholic, for example, if you're a Christian or a Muslim, because God is the boss, then a sin, this is for the Catholics, I asked my priest friend, by definition, this is a really important point, but by definition, a sin, a negative action, what defines it as being negative in the Christian terms is that God said you shouldn't do it. That's what makes it negative. This is a really powerful difference in Buddhism. There's no equivalent. It's a natural law. You know, harming another because it's based on delusions, because you harm another. You don't need anyone to tell you it's wrong, to make it wrong. It is in its nature wrong because you harmed another. And it was based on your delusion. So it's a natural law. It's not So a sin, a negative action in Buddhist terms, has got nothing to do with the fact that Buddha said it. So therefore, obviously, if I'm a Christian, in, to purify me, I have to ask God to forgive me. I'm not complaining about this, but this is not the Buddha's view. It's like going to your, in Buddha's view, Buddha's more like a doctor. You know, if, if Greg's eaten that sugar and he knows it's going to give him diabetes, he doesn't want the future suffering, and he goes to his doctor, he doesn't say, please forgive me for eating sugar and then get the doctor to stop him getting diabetes. We would laugh at that, but that's the Buddha's view. That's natural law. You don't ask Buddha to forgive you. He would. He's a nice guy, but that's not the issue. That's a huge one. So I think in our daily life, we misuse forgiveness. So look, I've got a relationship with Gonzalo, and then, started, then I start to get mad at him every day, and I shout and yell at him, and I'm going to work, and I'm feeling all this guilt. This oh, And the guilt is this neurotic state of mind, 
and I'm terror. Basically, guilt is I'm a you know I'm scared really in the, with Gonzalo. I'm scared that he will reject me. So I don't see that part of myself. I just think I'm trying to be a nice person, begging him to forgive me. And then he says, it's all right, Rabina, I still love you. And then I kind of go, phew, I got off the hook again. What a relief. But that's no help. It's not helpful. He ought to be my friend and say, Rabina, I'm happy to forgive you. But honey, child, you better tell me, you better make, you better decide to change. So we can misuse other people to forgive us, to make us feel better. That's very heavy. We, it's really, we don't see it. And because Gonzalo is scared that I'll reject him, he's more than happy to forgive me. But I'm just, I'll be bad mouth him again tomorrow until I decide I won't do it again. So forgiveness is not enough. And the tragedy is, like I said to Greg, let's say he hurt, let's say he whatever family member he's talking about. Let's say they're mad at him and he goes and asks them to forgive him. And let's say they don't forgive him. If we rely upon forgiveness to make us, to, to purify us, he'll go crazy. Then he'll still think I'm a bad person. This is mistaken. That's why the process of the four, four opponent powers, these four steps is so crucial because it's your own mind. He has to forgive himself. That's what regret is. I did do that, but look, I didn't mean to do it. I was a fool. I had ignorance and I, it's like compassion for yourself. This is unbelievably important. Then compassion for the other person. Then you purify it. Then you decide to change there's no karma we can't purify and it's a bonus if someone forgives you and if they don't then it doesn't mean you still can't get better that's their problem it's unfortunate what else people any other points nothing all right what else for nothing Christopher, you're in Mexico. How's Mexico, Christopher? Is your house nice or is it all rotting since you've been there? No, it's beautiful. Good. And, uh, but you've got a jumper on, which is not sunny. Oh, we're just sitting in a little shade right now, but it's very hot. Oh, is it really? Okay, good. He's off for holiday for 10 days. Good, Christopher. Happy. Happy. Enjoy. What else, people? Anything else, sweethearts? Time to go in again. Look at that. Eight minutes. Time goes so quickly. What else? No questions. So let me summarize them. Okay, let me summarize. One, Buddha has found methods to stop suffering. So, okay, there's more. Obviously, okay, he's found methods to stop suffering and it's and to stop and, and, there are, and the causes of it. And he found methods, therefore, to get happiness and, and to found the causes of it. That's it. That's the essence of it. So, of course, we've got to go in more depth and realize there are different levels of suffering and different levels of happiness. It's very pretty clear, you know. But the, the, the really essential point here is that he's telling us that the, the presence in our mind day to day, forget about past karma and all that, but the presence in our mind day to day of the delusions They themselves right there, that second, the presence of the depression, the anxiety, the guilt, the negativity, the fears, whatever it might be, the very presence in our mind, this second of those delusions is itself the cause of the pain right now, right now, right now, this second. So forget about this karmic explanations. There's much more explanations to it. And then that's why... And this is, this is just the way it is, you know. So then we have to, that's why if we try and can cultivate positive thoughts, if we can manage to cultivate positive thoughts and try and believe what they are saying, that itself in the mind is the, is the cause of the pleas any pleasant feelings we have. So this can be quite difficult, but sometimes we can see there's no pleasant feelings at all. What we'll do is just got torture, you know. Whereas you can see some people, you can see some people, no matter how bad things are out there, they just like happy people because their minds are virtuous. I'm not talking about happy people getting cake and getting, you know, getting cake and getting, getting, getting what attachment wants every second. Because that attack, that happiness is polluted and it doesn't last. It does not last. So it becomes more unhappiness in a minute. But the happiness we're talking about here, just on a conventional level, the happy feelings that are, that are triggered by having virtuous thoughts. We can see people like this. Some people 
you know, we tell they're just naturally happy, you know. That means they've got, well, okay, there's two things. They've got lots of past karma of being virtuous such that pleasant feelings keep popping up now. But their minds now have got, they've got happy thoughts, kind thoughts, generous thoughts, compassionate thoughts. I mean, one of my sisters, I've got several sisters and a brother. And, you know, I mean, it's like she sort of said it as a thing she just known all her life. Well, of course, happy feelings come from helping people. What do you think? I mean, I only burst into tears. I mean, I had to learn that, you know. I was so caught up in my own misery. I didn't know about it. I mean, helping people sounded so, oh, you mean, but what about me? What do you mean I've got to help people? I want to be, can't someone make me happy? That's how we feel, isn't it? No, there's no one there to make me happy. But some people just naturally think, well, what can I do for others? And they go out there and they do it. They're happy people. They've got the tendency to be happy, positive thoughts from past virtue. And right now, their thoughts are virtuous. So they've got their mind is happy. Virtue is one thing, happiness is another. So, of course, it takes time. We can be overwhelmed by our negative ones and only be miserable. That's okay, but we can change. It's not set in stone. It is not, and that should give us great courage. That should give us confidence, you know. So try and cultivate then the thoughts, what can I do for others? I mean, it sounds so, when you're overwhelmed by your own misery, it sounds mean and kind of, I've got to be, go, go out and be a goody-goody, you know. But this is how many, I mean, you see it during these times when there's difficulty and suffering. Some people from loneliness and despair from being on their own in their house, wondering who's going to make me happy every day. I've got no one to make me happy. That's loneliness, isn't it? And then the other people, what can I do to make other people happy? I mean, you can't make them, you can't make the negative one go away overnight. and You can't make the positive one suddenly make you happy overnight. But if we can understand the logic of them. You know, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. So love is a virtue. Attachment is ridiculous. And, and happy feeling is just what it is, a happy feeling, you know. And we want the happy feelings that aren't polluted by attachment. So the happy feeling, the pra- we've got to practice, practice virtuous thoughts. That's what will bring happy feelings that are more stable and valid and that won't change so quickly into unhappy feelings, which is what happens to the happy feelings you get when you eat the cake or get the Gonzalo, you know, because you know that you keep eating the cake, happy feelings come, and you, can, you can't believe these happy feelings, but you're not happy. This is a whole other analysis. You've had the first mouthful of cake, and the happiest feeling definitely came. And you, you should ask yourself, I wonder why I just don't be content with that. Because it's going to be the happiest feeling you'll get because you already know from your experience the second piece of cake, the happy feeling that it triggers is not quite so good. But we're so driven with dissatisfaction, we keep thinking the next piece will do it. So we miss out on the happiness we got just then and we want another piece of cake. And before you know it, you're going to vomit. And the happy feeling is turned into an unhappy feeling. This is scientific truth. This is not religion. So it needs a lot of analysis. And then courage and confidence. That's the main thing, you know, people. One Venerable? Yes. Venerable Robina. It's Jane oh, Birkbeck. Hello, oh, happy we're to time together. Hello, my darling. Yes. I, I just, you know, you have actually, this is the right teaching at the right time. It's so magical. Oh, uh, you have given me great courage. I am, <laughs> I'm going to see my daughter, who has not spoken to me for some years, and very angry with me, and for very good reason. But the teaching on, on, on how to approach that and not yes. go looking forgiveness and making myself better but coming with compassion yes and just saying i i just so regret i so regret you know and maybe someday she'll actually forgive me but right. not to go looking for that it's That's so exactly helpful oh my I'm darling happy. robina i'm so I just happy love you so much i'm so Thank happy you. i'm so happy that you're going to see her again this is amazing Yes, to show her lots of love and lots of affection. That's all you can do. And then the rest is up to her. Yes. Well done, Jane. That's amazing. That's a good stop. A perfect point to end on, Jane. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. So have courage, people, and never give up. Never give up. Never give up. And use this intelligence of ours. We've all got these brilliantly intelligent minds. I, mean, I think Tibetans, when they first met Westerners, they were really impressed by our brilliant technological minds our brilliant way of we've got this brilliant capacity for thinking it's why we invented so many brilliant things but we we, we just we, we underestimate that aspect of ourselves so we should use that squeeze our brains as lovely as she says to learn the nuts and bolts of this stuff and then from this comes the experience you know so be so happy you people and that's it
Thank you, dearest Mary. Thank you, everybody. Jung Chob. Sem Jogram Poche, Maki Panam, Keguchi, Ke Panyam Pame Payang, Gong Ne Gong Du Pabasho.